Hey there, Visual Politic community. Every time we have told you about Russia in the last two years, it has basically been for some issue directly related to the invasion of Ukraine. And right now the question is, what should we do about Ukraine? Hungary's Prime Minister Viktor Orban has unveiled, following a meeting with Trump, what the former American president's plan is if he gets back to the Oval Office. Basically, it consists of cutting off any assistance to the Ukrainian government in order to force them to bend the knee to Russia. In that way, according to the former president, the war would be over. The question, beyond whether or not we think this is honest, clean, and decent, is that if anyone believes that by dropping Ukraine, and giving Putin a Pyrrhic victory, Putin will be satisfied, that person would be very wrong. The reality may be very different. Russia considering intervention in European region. Vladimir Putin, a leader who is probably in the last phase of his life, and thus of his time at the helm of Russia, is obsessed with one thing above all else, regaining Russia's greatness and becoming a sort of reincarnation of Peter the Great. It turns out that Ukraine has been a kind of thorn in the side of all of these intentions. So as you just heard, Russia could be thinking about launching a fresh invasion against another European country. In a past video, we already told you about the real possibility that Russia could end up attacking NATO if Trump returns to the White House and withdraws the nuclear umbrella. However, even before that, there could be another victim on the Kremlin's radar, Moldova. This could be the next country to suffer Moscow's wrath. But why now? And why Moldova? Well, you see, one of the reasons to focus on this country, and the one that may carry the most weight, is precisely the loss of influence that Moscow has had in recent years. Not to mention the deterioration in the perception of Russia held by the Moldovan public. A deterioration in which, clearly, the invasion of Ukraine plays a large part. But that is not the only thing we can take into account. In recent times, just as Kyiv tried to do in its day, Moldova has taken great steps to seek integration within the European Union and other Western institutions. And that, once again, could be a point of no return. Moldova faces multiple threats from Russia as it turns toward EU membership, foreign minister says. Well, to achieve the goal of punishing Moldova for being so rebellious, Putin has a great ally within the country itself a Trojan horse that has been the biggest headache for Moldovans for a long time. We are talking, of course, about the Transnistrian region. Sandwiched between Ukraine and the rest of Moldova, Transnistria is a separatist region with a strong Russian identity that declared itself independent in 1990. Following a confrontation between Moldovan and Transnistrian forces that lasted two years and left more than 1,000 victims, the conflict has been completely frozen. In fact, of all the frozen conflicts in the post-Soviet space, the Transnistrian conflict has undoubtedly lasted the longest. We are talking about a period of more than 30 years. In recent months, however, tensions between the Moldovan and Transnistrian authorities have escalated, and many analysts are now even warning that Russia could begin an intervention in the country to protect the separatist Moldovan region. Between a rock and a hard place. When a conflict breaks out, the first natural reaction of the victim is usually negotiation. We saw this in Ukraine at the beginning of the war, when Ukrainian and Russian authorities met several times in Belarus. Well, in the case of Moldova and the crisis with Transnistria, it was no different. After the peace agreement signed by both sides in 1992, not only was a so-called Russian peace mission deployed in the separatist region, but negotiations also began to resolve the conflict once and for all. Negotiations that had the support of the European Union, Ukraine, Russia, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, and, of course, good old Uncle Sam. The whole gang was in on the action. However, despite all the efforts, the reality is that no agreement has ever been reached. And guess why? Exactly. Moscow had a lot to do with it. Since its self-proclaimed independence, Transnistria has been heavily influenced by Russia, both politically and economically. On the one hand, it was Russia that shaped the current regime in power, modelled after motherland Russia, a kind of presidentialist regime heavily infiltrated by the strong local oligarchy. What's more, Moscow also supported as much as possible that this narrow strip of land developed its own military and its own currency, among other things. In other words, Moscow has been the main architect of the fact that Transnistria has organised itself as a virtual state, but a state which is not recognized by any country in the world. 
And that's not all. Russia has also given a lot of economic aid to this separatist region, from funding for social projects to almost free natural gas. In fact, the natural gas received by Transnistria has traditionally been used not only to fuel its industry, but also to pressure Moldova with electricity generation that depends on that gas and is crucial for the country as a whole. Nevertheless, despite the enormous Russian influence, in reality, it has been the Moldovan state that has been the main pillar on which Transnistria has been built. You see, not only has it continued to use its postal service and its transport infrastructure, but this territory has also been one of the main beneficiaries of the free trade agreement that Moldova signed with the European Union in 2014. Something like independence depending on what it is you need. Mind you, this area has been under constant pressure from Chisinau, as the Moldovan government has been stepping up its claim to assert full sovereignty over the separatist region. And so, when Russia first invaded Ukraine in 2014, Moldova and Ukraine began actively trying to isolate Transnistria. To give you an idea, Ukraine banned the passage of Transnistrian products through its territory, which was a severe blow to its economy. Keep in mind that Ukraine was the natural way for their products to reach Russia. And obviously, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, since the end of February 2022, the isolation of Transnistria has only increased. Ukraine closed all its accesses to the border with Transnistria and Moldova, and completely closed the airspace to Russian aircraft. Thus, the rebellious region was completely at the mercy of Moldova, which from then on could control all imports and exports from this country. But pay attention because if this was already a drastic change, in reality what caused tensions to explode to current levels was this. Moldova tells companies in breakaway Transnistria time to pay taxes. Oh no, visual politic viewers, here comes the tax man. Chisinau has made it very clear to Tiraspol it's time to settle accounts. Until last year, companies in the separatist region were exempt from paying import and export duties to the European Union and the rest of Moldova. Well, that golden era has come to an end. Transnistrian companies will now have to pay these fees to both Chisinau and to Raspol. All this has been done with the aim of leveling the playing field throughout the country. But of course, as was to be expected, the decision has not gone down well. A breakaway region of Moldova asks Russia for protection. Just as you hear it, Transnistrian authorities have asked Russia for protection from what they have described as a blatant attack on the human rights and the social and economic freedoms of their population. In fact, on 28th of February, the region's Congress passed a resolution once again asking for Russia's help to protect the 222,000 citizens holding Russian passports in Transnistria. We are talking about approximately 50% of the entire population. Clearly, this resolution is directly aimed against the doctrine that Russia has used to temper all countries under the former Soviet orbit, invoking its alleged right to intervene to ensure the security of ethnic Russians. This is what is known as the Karaganov Doctrine. The Russian Excuse those of you who are loyal visual politic viewers may already be familiar with the Karaganov Doctrine. In some past videos, we have already told you how this idea is the main weapon used by Russia to keep hold of countries that were formerly part of its orbit and now want to escape from it. Well, one of the most radical examples of this idea of protecting ethnic Russians is the use of quasi-state allies. That is, territories or organizations with sufficient power to function as states, but which are not internationally recognized. It's an old and familiar tactic. Iran, for instance, does something very similar with Hezbollah in Lebanon or with the Houthis in Yemen. Russia itself has such branches in territories such as South Ossetia and Abkhazia in Georgia and had them in the Donbass in Ukraine before the invasion. And of course, also in Transnistria. So basically, Putin's modus operandi is repeated over and over again. And that is why many now fear that Moldova may suffer the effects of the Karaganov Doctrine, as already happened in Georgia in 2008, and has been happening in Ukraine since 2014. 
You see, devised by the Russian political scientist Sergei Karaganov, the doctrine that bears his name is a geopolitical strategy whose main tool is the massive distribution of Russian passports. It is what is known as passportization. These passports are generally distributed in areas of the post-Soviet space, usually regions with separatist aspirations within certain countries, or areas with an ethnic Russian majority with close economic or blood ties with Russia. Under this doctrine, Russian foreign policy should focus on protecting the integrity of ethnic Russians abroad. And then, with the excuse that there is a high concentration of citizens for Russian passports, Russia claims for itself the right to intervene militarily. Now, what exactly happens in the case of Moldova and Transnistria? Well, you can imagine. The ethnic Russian population in Transnistria is slightly larger than the Moldovan one, approximately one third of each. And then a quarter of the population is ethnic Ukrainian. As a result, of the region's approximately 400,000 inhabitants, some 200,000 hold Russian passports. Therefore, in view of Transnistria's requests for protection, many analysts believe that Russia could apply the Karaganov Doctrine here as well in order to annex the Moldovan separatist territory. In fact, Russia is already using the same rhetoric it used with Ukraine to pave the way for intervention in this small Eastern European country. Look at what Sergei Lavrov, Russia's foreign minister, recently said about Moldova. From the very beginning of the post-Soviet era, the West began to wedge itself into relations between Russia and its neighbors. This is also visible in Central Asia, in the Transcaucasus. This is also visible in the European part of the former USSR. Ukraine, Moldova. Taking all this into account, anyone could think that the Karaganov Doctrine could manifest itself again in its worst aspect open war. And as you see, this time it could take place in Transnistria. Now, how important is this small strip of land for Russia? And is it really possible that Russia is going to invade Moldova for it? Well, let's take a look. Moldova, next Russian victim? With such a Russian Trojan horse inside the country, do you think Moldova has been able to do what it wanted as an independent country? Well, as I'm sure you can imagine, the answer is no. Its national and international policy has traditionally been accompanied by a kind of pulsometer to measure how much a sensitive decision could strain the relationship with Moscow. And in this regard, Transnistria has played a key role. Think about it. Because of this separatist region, Moldova has not only remained within the Russian sphere of influence, but this has also been one of the main reasons that have, so far, slowed down Moldova's path towards the European Union and NATO. However, the reality is that, in spite of everything, and even if it has been at a slow pace, since 2009, Moldova has been looking more and more towards the European Union. And with each passing year, and election after election, Moldovan Europeanism is gaining more and more ground. Pro-EU party in Moldova wins clear majority in election. What's more, under the presidency of the pro-European Maya Sandu, Moldova managed, along with Ukraine, to become an official candidate for EU membership in June 2022. And not surprisingly, this news did not sit well in the Kremlin. They described this action as a threat to Russia and repeated all the threatening rhetoric to which we are accustomed every time something does not fit in with their plans. The problem is that, in the case of Moldova, these threats cannot be taken so lightly precisely because one of its regions, Transnistria, is occupied by Russian soldiers. And to top it off, this region borders a country that is currently at war with Russia. But beware, Transnistria is not only key to Russian influence in Moldova, it could also be a key factor in the evolution of the war in Ukraine. <laughs> The fact is that if Russia were to succeed in annexing Transnistria, it could deal a severe blow to Ukraine. It would be a coup that could consist of encircling the Odessa area from Crimea in the east and from Transnistria in the west, thus making it easier to eventually cut off Ukraine's access to the Black Sea. In fact, that has been one of Moscow's major objectives since the invasion began. Among other reasons, because Ukraine continues exporting from Odessa and its port, and with that, its economy stays more or less alive. In the ICU, but alive. Now, the theory sounds very nice for the Russians, but the truth is that it would not be so simple. Ukraine holds Odessa, and it surrounds tightly, and Russian troops have no way to penetrate Transnistria from Ukraine. But of course, as we've told you, Russia does have troops in Transnistria itself. 
since the signing of the peace agreement between Moldova and Transnistria in 1992, the separatist region has maintained about 400 Russian peacekeepers. Since 1995, however, this figure has been increased to 1,200 Russian troops who have been stationed in its capital, to Raspol. On paper, the Kremlin says that the sole purpose of these soldiers is to protect the Kobasna Arms Depot, the largest ammunition depot of the Cold War, which, you guessed it, is located in Transnistria. We are talking about more than 20,000 tons of weapons and ammunition that, although obsolete, could easily be used in combat. Now, many of you may be thinking, ah, what use are 1,200 Russian soldiers? That is very little. And yes, it is not a huge number, but what if I tell you that the Moldovan armed forces have only 6,500 professional troops? What if I tell you that, besides being so few in number, they are also poorly equipped? What if we also take into account that these 1,200 soldiers could be complemented by the Transnistrian forces? Defense Minister says 90% of Moldova's military equipment is outdated. In 2023, Moldova spent barely $80 million on its armed forces. And that's after a 70% year-on-year increase in military spending in 2022. I'll leave it to you to calculate the pittance they had been spending. Now, after the increase, its military spending relative to GDP is a paltry 0.55%, and that with a war on its doorstep. All this means one thing. Moldova, in the face of a well-organized and sufficiently equipped attack from Russia, could resist only thanks to the help of the West. And to rely on this at a time when aid is trickling into Ukraine itself is very, very risky. Does 1,200 Russian troops seem so few to you anymore? In fact, the Russian weapons stockpiled in Transnistria could be enough even to take over Moldova without much effort, if they were accompanied by a good strategy. The only hope for Moldova and for US and Western intelligence that Russia will not launch an all-out attack against Transnistria is Ukraine's own resistance. Why? Well, because the war of attrition in which it is engaged in Ukraine is absorbing too many resources. It is therefore seen as more likely that Moscow will focus on attempting a hybrid action in the run-up to the country's next presidential election to be held in the fall of 2024. As Moldova continues to integrate with Europe, we believe Russia is pursuing options to weaken the Moldovan government, probably with the eventual goal of seeing a more Russian-friendly administration in the capital. It is believed that, in the short term, Russia could intensify, with the help of the Transnistrians, its hybrid warfare operations, that is, both military and non-military operations, such as cyber attacks, terrorism, or the widespread use of fake news. Moldova's premier said authorities will focus on stemming Russian efforts to manipulate public opinion ahead of two crucial ballots this year as the war in Ukraine diminishes any direct threat by the Kremlin. And all with the aim of weakening the Moldovan government and getting a pro-Russian administration in the next elections. For instance, the Moldovan newspaper, Zirul Garda, revealed that the Russian-funded Moldovan oligarch, Ilan Shaw, had been organizing protests and paying people to demonstrate against the current government. So, you see, the oldest frozen conflict in post-Soviet space seems to be thawing rapidly after 30 years of hibernation. Moldovan efforts to economically reintegrate Transnistria have shattered the relative calm of the territory's political oligarchy, which has now not hesitated to ask Russia for protection. And although many have speculated about a Russian military operation in Moldova, everything seems to indicate that it would prefer to keep its resources in Ukraine and try to gain an ally in the upcoming autumn elections. Of course, if that strategy will not work, we cannot rule out other, more serious actions. But at this point, the questions are over to you. What would happen if if Putin failed to get a pro-Russian president in Moldova, would he then be willing to invade neighboring Ukraine as well? Would Moldova manage to resist the Russian onslaught like Ukraine? How would NATO react? Leave us your opinions below in the comments and let's open a debate. And very important, if you like this video, like it and subscribe to Visual Politic if you haven't already done so. These are small gestures that really help us a lot. As always, thank you for watching. All the best. See you next time.